So many of these technologies are things that integrate the world of atoms, the physical world, the world of bits, the computational world, and the world of culture. And you see these examples in things like the pop-up pizza stand that uses Twitter to be able to communicate where it is, uh, or Etsy and other online sites for being able to make new things. Uh, the enormous rise of social media in the last few years. Uh, and our students are really excited about this and they're making it. So for example, here are a couple of uh, former graduate students from my group who have gone on to found companies in this space, uh, many of which you have heard of or used. And I think that there's a couple of things to note here. Um, one of them is that all of these students did a number of different things before they hit on something that became a big idea. Uh, another one that I didn't even realize until after I put the slide together uh, is that a majority of these students uh, are first or I think all of them are either first or second generation uh, Americans and so having opportunities like UC San Diego to be able to train students to do cool stuff like this uh, is tremendously valuable. So these successes are tremendously exciting, but they don't happen all the time. Nearly 90% of startups fail, nearly 90% of restaurants fail, nearly 90% of almost anything you can think about doing is going to fail. And I think that um, given that, why is the failure rate so high for creative endeavors? Pradeep uh, introduced the, us this afternoon by thinking about the importance of understanding creativity. And this is one of the scientific riddles for me uh, that my colleagues and I in the, in the social sciences are really interested in. And if, I think we can look at this in some ways by contrast with, with engineering. So we lack a, the principles that we need in design. However, uh, in engineering, it really excels at principle-driven practical theory, uh, but it draws on the physical sciences. And the human world is different. The relevant science for whether Twitter will succeed is not physics, it's the social sciences. People are really complex, and our introspection is valuable, but it can often be misleading. You know, I, I think many of you know that when we rely just on our intuitions rather than science, things can go bad. And industry, places like Google here, are extremely empirical, uh, but the, the primary focus of industry is making product, and so it tends to be more heads down. And this is what I see as the opportunity that Don Norman and I wrote about when uh, our colleagues and us started the design lab here, I think that is the UC San Diego opportunity. When we design, uh, I think that we're creating new things. And when we design in the research lab or in a university, we're inventing a new future. And the role of those research projects, of those inventions, is to find out what life is like in that future and then send postcards back to the rest of us. You can think about this as being like, a, uh, like the uh, travel guide, the lonely planet of what living in the future might be like. And so when you see projects from the design lab, you see examples of what the future might be like. I moved down to uh, San Diego from the Bay Area uh, almost two years ago, and I picked up swimming in the ocean. And I realized that the, the transition from swimming in a pool to being able to swim out in the wild, this is a, a, a big swim, a famous swim in La Jolla, out in the cove there, uh, where I swim often. Uh, is the same that change that we've seen in the world of design. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, the technology company that used to be on this campus uh, and all of its peers, the way that user-centered design worked then was that you would build a product and when you got it mostly done, you would bring a couple of people into the lab and let them try it out. And they would use it for a while and then when it got stuck and swore, you would write down what happened and fix those usability or technical bugs, do that a few more times, uh, and when you ran out of money or time, you would release it. And once you released it, you had almost no idea what anybody did with it. Think of all of the millions of personal computers in people's homes. And we had very little idea of what was happening. Now, by contrast, in the world of the web that we live in now, uh, and I think nowhere on earth is better to see that than, than this campus right here, is that we have a couple of new opportunities. The first one is you're not making 
just one thing and releasing it. We have the opportunity to create and release multiple alternative designs, which means that for the first time we can create a practical science of design to understand what works more, more effectively. Also, we have the opportunity to, to observe what happens after we've released it, so that it's not just a, I have no idea what's going on, uh, but you can really build knowledge over time. And I think that that's tremendously important. And the role of the university is to be able to aggregate and disseminate that knowledge and coordinate the, the foundational sciences work that's happening on campus with the applied challenges that we're seeing out there in the world. One of these in particular that the design lab is involved in is thinking about how we can scale the design studio. I started out uh, as an art major. Uh, I was really interested in the intersection of arts and technology. That passion led me to a PhD in computer science. And I think that interdisciplinary trajectory that I experienced is becoming increasingly the norm on campus. Uh, our design lab uh, sits in Atkinson Hall, which is a hub of researchers from all around campus. There's no one department there. It's people from many departments. And one of the things that we're looking at is how do you take this studio model of education where the shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder peer learning is so important, and how do we think about scaling that up to the globe? Because right now, uh, if you are an upper middle class American between the ages of 18 and 22, you have an awesome opportunity to be able to learn, especially if you're at San Diego. But when you graduate, the opportunity to take that history class that you were curious about or refresh new skills that you maybe didn't get when you were in college, it becomes more difficult. And so in our research group, we've been creating software for online learning that's more interesting than just hit play on a video and answer some multiple choice questions. Uh, we collaborated with Coursera to design and develop the first uh, peer assessment software. Uh, it's been used by more than 100 massive online classes. Uh, and they just hired an alum from my group uh, to, their, to their interaction design team. Um, and you can see how if you want to be able to have students making constitutional law arguments or understanding world music or learning about uh, character or social psychology or nutrition, we need a more sophisticated and probably more social online learning experience. And that's what our group is doing. It's an amazing opportunity for a small research group to actually be able to do science that's out there in the wild. And this is an extremely multidisciplinary effort that, uh, as you see, there's folks from all around the university. Uh, and we have a set of invited talks that are all available online for free. And I think that success here uh, is not just connecting the social sciences and engineering and other places, which we're already doing. One reason that I'm here today is I think that success will require reaching beyond the ivory tower and thinking about new opportunities for partnership to build practical theory for design. Um, and I wanted to conclude, I spoke at, at the Google I.O. conference uh, this year, and I was really struck by the prominence of the Internet of Things. And the Internet of Things is not just the Internet of Objects. It's the Internet of new constellations of social and technical capabilities that are changing how our lives work. And I think one great example of that is the Nest thermostat, uh, which uh, was a recent Google acquisition. And um, I think the, the thermostat actually has a, an, an accidental relation to uh, a wonderful quote when uh, uh, the President Barack Obama uh, first came to office. The, the philosophy professor, Cornell West, uh, gave him a piece of advice. Uh, he said, don't be the thermometer which takes the temperature. Uh, be the thermostat that sets the temperature. And I think that our opportunity in the design lab is to be able to set the temperature of design for the future, and I look forward to collaborating with many of you on this. Thank you.